All right, students, let's take notes on chemical reactions. Get out your science notebook and let's get started with the essential question at the top of your page. How do we write, balance, and classify chemical reaction equations? Well, let's start with the definition of a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is a process, that's, a process that involves the rearrangement of the molecular structure of substances into new substances. So here's an example of a chemical reaction. We have methane being combusted. Now here are the methane particles, and they need oxygen particles in order to combust. Now these particles, when they go through a reaction, they're going to rearrange themselves into new substances. Here, for example, we have carbon dioxide and water. Now, we can't see molecules with our naked eye, so it's not always easy to tell that a chemical change is taking place. So what we need to do is look for chemical evidences of chemical change when we're doing reactions. For example, if you mix two substances and light is emitted, and light could be in the form of like fire or phosphorescence, like in a glow stick, that is evidence that a chemical change is most likely taking place and molecules are rearranging themselves. The other evidences are whether a precipitate or a solid is forming, and typically we've used solubility rules in the past to figure that out. If gas or bubbles are being emitted, if there's a color change that doesn't happen because of a dye, then that is good evidence that chemical change is taking place. Same if it's getting hot or cold, or if there's an odor being emitted where there was no odor before. Here's a chemical reaction equation. This is how we model chemical reactions, uh, just showing the molecular formulas. Now I'm going to just go over the different parts. The first part of the reactants. The reactants are on the left side of this reaction arrow right here, and they represent the things, the, the substances we're starting with. So in this reaction, we have hydrogen and oxygen. Those are our reactants or our ingredients in this chemical reaction. Now the reaction arrow represents a change. The change is taking place and it's going through a reaction. On the right side of the arrow, we get a product or products, and these are the substances that are produced from the reactants. They're the things that were changed into from the reactants. Now, if you'll notice that there's some numbers, these green numbers in front of each of the molecules, these are known as coefficients, and they represent the molecular quantity or molar quantities of things. It's kind of like the, the amount you would need in order to do this recipe. Now, everything has a coefficient, although we sometimes don't write the number one. So even oxygen in this equation has a coefficient, it's the coefficient is one, but we don't typically write the number one because it's implied by being there. The last thing are the little tiny um, phase or state symbols found on the bottom right hand corner. Now the different phases or states the substance can be in is solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. Now aqueous is a special um, type of phase symbol we only use in chemical equation to represent that the substance was dissolved in water. All right, before we start writing our own chemical reaction equations, I have a few hints I want to make sure that you are aware of. The first hint deals with ionic and covalent compounds. Be sure you review how to write ionic and covalent compounds, because knowing how to write them correctly is essential. Let's take a few practice chances right now. Here's magnesium bromide. Magnesium bromide is an ionic compound. We know it's an ionic compound because it's made of a metal and a nonmetal. Carbon dinitride is a covalent compound. We know this because carbon dinitride is made of carbon and nitrogen, which are both nonmetals. So ionic compounds have a metal and nonmetals in it. Covalent compounds only have nonmetals. Copper three oxide, there's a metal and a nonmetal, so that's an ionic compound. Lithium sulfate is a metal and multiple nonmetals, so that's an ionic compound. And then diphosphorus tetrachloride, that's phosphorus and chlorine, so that's only nonmetals, which makes it a covalent compound. Knowing the type of compound lets us know how to write these equations. Let's go back to magnesium bromide. We know it's ionic, therefore we have to worry about the charges of each. Magnesium is a plus two and bromine is a minus one based on its location on the periodic table. Therefore, in order to write the formula for magnesium bromide, we would need one magnesium and two bromines put together. Carbon dinitride is a covalent compound, so we don't need to worry about charge when we put them together. So how do we know how many there are? Well, that's where these prefix come into play, and the prefix are found on the back of your periodic table. Carbon dinitride is one carbon, and di means two, so two nitrogens. So carbon dinitride is CN2.
All right, copper three oxide is an ionic compound. Copper three, copper is a transition metal. And notice the Roman numerals three next to it. That lets us know that the copper's charge is a plus three. Oxygen's charge is a minus two based on its position on the periodic table. Therefore, to put them together, we need two coppers and three oxygen so they cancel each other out. So copper three oxide's formula is Cu2O3. Lithium sulfate is ionic, so we need to worry about charge. Lithium is a plus one. Sulfate is a polyatomic ion found on the bottom part of the front of our periodic table. Sulfate is SO4, and its charge is minus two. Therefore, we need two lithiums and only one sulfate in order to make lithium sulfate. Diphosphorus tetrachloride is covalent, so we worry about the prefixes. Diphosphorus means two phosphorus. Tetrachloride, tetra means four, so four chlorines. All right, the second helpful hint when we write chemical reaction equations is acids. Now, we didn't get a chance to talk about acids this semester, but later on, if you were to take AP Chemistry or Chemistry 2, we'll learn a little bit more about acids. For this, it's really easy. Just check on the back of your periodic table. There's a list of acids back there. So if you ever see acids in a chemical reaction equation, just write what you see on the back of the periodic table. The third helpful hint is all about diatomic molecules. Now we briefly learned about these before. Mostly we just wanted you to memorize which of the molecules were diatomic. Heck, you can even use your periodic table and make a little note on which ones are diatomic. Now these are special molecules that whenever you see them as pure elements in a chemical reaction, they have to have a little subscript of two, and they're the only ones that do that naturally when they're pure elements. So I'm going to give you an example of that. Here we have hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas to form water. Now, when hydrogen, when we write hydrogen, we don't just write H, we write H2 because it's one of the special seven diatomic molecules. Same with oxygen. Oxygen is one of the special seven as well, so we write O2. So both hydrogen and oxygen are diatomic. Now, water, on the other hand, is not diatomic because it's not a pure element, it's a compound. It's just a coincidence that water has H2 in it. That H is not diatomic in this sense. Notice that the oxygen doesn't even have a 2. Again, because it's not diatomic, it's part of a compound. All right, let's do a little bit of a practice right now. We're going to write the reaction equation where magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. I like to take that really wordy problem and make a really simple word reaction or a word equation going on. So this takes out all the fluff. We have magnesium plus hydrochloric acid. I like to think of the plus as kind of like an and in this case. And those react, shown by the reaction arrow, to create magnesium chloride and hydrogen. So in order to write this formula, we're going to need to kind of use all those different hints and all the different parts that we've learned previously. Let's start with magnesium. Magnesium is just a periodic table element. So really simply, we just write Mg. Next, let's look at hydrochloric acid. The word acid is a major hint that we should probably go look at the acids list on, our, on the back of our periodic table and write the appropriate one. So in this case, hydrochloric acid is HCl. All right, those two reactants react to form two products, magnesium chloride and hydrogen. Well, magnesium chloride is a compound. Specifically, it's an ionic compound because it's a metal and a nonmetal. So we have to worry about the charges. So Mg and Cl come together to make it MgCl2. The last piece is hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is a special molecule because it's one of those special diatomic elements. So we can't just write H like we did with magnesium. We have to write H2 because it's diatomic. All right, so I want to look at this equation with a little bit of detail, and I want to relate it to this really important concept called the law of conservation of mass. Now, the law of conservation of mass states that atoms are neither created or destroyed in a chemical reaction, and the quantity of atoms must be conserved. So let's take a look at our reaction that we just wrote. So first, we have magnesium and hydrochloric acid. Those particles right here are going to be used to create these substances over here on the product side. So let's try to do that. All right. First, we're going to take magnesium and chlorine, and we're going to make magnesium chloride. Now, you might have just noticed something wrong. What happened was, even though we started with one magnesium and one chlorine, in our product side, we somehow added an extra chlorine. This does not obey the law of conservation of mass. We can't just magically create an atom out of nowhere. Same thing, if we take the hydrogen from the reactant side and try to make the hydrogen from the product side, it says H2. Where did that extra hydrogen come from? So this reaction is actually not correctly written, at least not yet. So let's start over from the beginning and see if we can figure it out. 
Instead, we got to think about the quantities of particles. One thing we haven't written are the coefficients. In fact, instead of having one hydrochloric acid, what if we had two hydrochloric acid molecules or two moles of hydrochloric acid? Well, if we were to do this reaction now, taking the magnesium and the chlorine and combining them together, and the two hydrogens and combining them together, this makes a lot more sense. And this reaction obeys the law of conservation of mass. So that leads me to a very important concept called balancing chemical equations. Chemical equations must obey the law of conservation of mass. Unfortunately, reaction descriptions often don't tell us chemical quantities. So it's our job to balance them by adding the correct coefficients, which is what I'm going to teach you how to do right now. Before we do that, here are a few balancing tips. The first tip you should do before you even balance, so before you talk about coefficients, make sure that your compound formulas are correctly written, i.e. make sure you know how to write ionic and covalent compounds. The coefficients are the absolute last step in writing a chemical reaction. Now, when you balance, you should only change coefficients, never touch the subscripts. That includes polyatomic ions or the ionic compounds that you've made or the covalent compounds. If elements are in multiple compounds, you might want to save them for later. Sometimes they get a little bit messy, but save the complicated ones for later and things might work out. Sometimes things become unbalanced. Just keep trying and keep doing it. I call this the clean your room symptom. Sometimes you start cleaning one area of your room and then go to clean another only to find that the original area gets dirty again. If you just keep going, eventually things will be cleaned up. Lastly, treat polyatomic ions as a single unit. And I'll give you an example of these in our, in our next few practices. All right, so here's a practice. Zinc 2 sulfide plus oxygen gives you zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. That's a chemical reaction equation. Now, we're going to need to write the, the different compounds based on all the different hints we saw before. And I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. Again, if you're struggling writing ionic or covalent compounds, you should really go back and review those. The first one is zinc 2 sulfide. That zinc 2, so zinc with a positive 2 charge, and sulfur is a minus 2 charge, so there's one of each of those. Oxygen, in this case, is one of the special diatomic elements, so we have to write it as O2. Zinc oxide, so in this case, zinc is still a plus 2 charge, and oxygen is a minus two charge, so there's one zinc and one oxygen going together. Lastly, sulfur dioxide is a covalent compound, so that's one sulfur and two oxygens. Let's check to see if this formula is balanced. This is another way we can balance a reaction by accounting for each side. Let's start with the reactants. Let's, first, we see that there's on the reactant side, there's only one zinc element. There's only one sulfur element, and there are two oxygen elements. On the right-hand side, or the product side, there is one zinc element, so that's balanced and good. There's one sulfur element, but there's three oxygen elements on the right. So this reaction is not balanced. It is not obeying the law of conservation of mass, and it's our job to fix it by adding coefficients. So I'm not going to touch any of the subscripts. For example, this two here, this two here, and I'm not going to change any of the little numbers at the bottom, but I can add coefficients to the front. Let's start with the oxygen on the right side. I don't like the fact that the oxygen on the right is three or an odd number. That doesn't go into the oxygen on the left very well. So I'm going to times this odd oxygen oxygen right here by two. What that does is it changes both my zinc and my oxygen. I have to add a coefficient. I cannot just add a little subscript down here because that's going to change zinc oxide's formula. So now that I have two zincs on the right side and four oxygens on the right side, I, I kind of mess things up a little bit on my left side. So I'm going to go ahead and add a coefficient in front of the zinc 2 sulfide to fix my zincs. Now that changes my zincs, but it also changes my sulfur. Again, I'm kind of trying to clean things up and it's getting a little bit more messy, but that's okay. I'm going to go back to my product side and I'm going to multiply that compound by two as well. That changes the number of sulfurs, but it also changes the numbers of oxygens. We have two times two oxygens, four right here, but don't forget we also have two oxygens here, so we have six total oxygens. All right, we've finally gotten back to the oxygens, and six is a number that two can go into. If we multiply our O2 by three, we're going to get six oxygens on the reactant side. Sometimes it's a lot of tedious work to be able to figure out how to balance the reaction, but the more practice you have, the better. In fact, here's a practice for you. See if you can figure this one out. Try to use some of those hints we saw before. Did you try it yourself? All right, let's see if we can do it together. On the reactant side, we have sodium, chlorine, 
copper, and we're going to keep nitrate together. There's one sodium, one chlorine, one copper, and this little subscript 2 on the outside of nitrate represents that there's two nitrates. We can do this because we find nitrate on the other side. On the product side, we have one sodium, we have two chlorines, we have one copper, and we only have one nitrate. So there's our nitrate right there. All right, we need to go ahead and balance this. I'm going to start by putting a 2 in front of this first reactant because I want to make sure that my chlorines become balanced. So just focusing on my chlorines, my chlorines now become two on my reactants and they're two on the product, so we're good there. Unfortunately, by adding that coefficient, I kind of screwed up my sodium. So I'm going to go to the product side and fix my sodiums by adding a coefficient in front of sodium nitrate. All right, so that changes my sodiums to be a two. And it also changes my nitrate to be a 2 as well, because this 2 foils into both the sodium as well as the nitrate itself. And hey, that actually was really helpful. That helped balance our reaction. If you look, this reaction now with those coefficients obey the law of conservation of mass. All right, the last thing I want to talk about are the classifications of reactions. There are five types of chemical reactions that we want to be able to recognize. Once we write a reaction, we want to know which type of reaction we're looking at. So here are the five types. There's composition or synthesis. Those are the same thing. There's decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and combustion. By the way, these reactions and kind of their general forms are written on the back of your periodic table. You should look at these as we're going through them because you can use this as a resource. You don't need to memorize them as long as you can recognize them. Let's start with a, com a composition, not a combustion, a composition or a synthesis reaction. This is where two reactants combine to form one product. Now I've kind of underlined one of the key indicators of the reaction that we're looking at. So notice we have two things combining to form one. Here's an example of that. Here we have iron and oxygen and they form iron oxide. So two elements forming one compound. Now it could be two compounds forming one compound as well. Here's calcium oxide and water forming calcium hydroxide. Again, two substances coming together to form one product. All right, the opposite of a synthesis reaction is called a decomposition reaction. One reactant breaks apart to form two products. Now again, I kind of emphasize the term one reactant. That's kind of a key indicator to let you know a decomposition reaction is taking place. So here we have potassium carbonate. Then there's nothing it's reacting with. So the only thing it can really do is break apart into multiple pieces. So potassium carbonate breaks apart into potassium oxide and carbon dioxide. You can say things say the same thing about mercury two oxide. So mercury two oxide breaks apart into mercury mercury and oxygen. All right, next is single replacement reaction. This is where we have a compound and a single element. And that single element replaces a similarly charged element in that compound. I like to think of this kind of like a dance. Here we have a couple dancing. And then over here we have just a single person or element. And that element wants to dance. So it's going to go and ask one of the two other elements if it can butt in and dance. And depending on its charge depends on which element it's going to go ask. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here we have aluminum and iron 2 nitrate. In this case we have our single element and a compound. Now aluminum wants to go and dance. So it's going to go and attach to nitrate because nitrate's oppositely charged of it. And then iron's going to go off and be alone. Similarly, here we have sodium or we have sodium iodide and fluorine, which is a diatomic element. Here, fluorine is our single element and it wants to go dance. So fluorine is going to go ask sodium because sodium is oppositely charged of it, and then iodine is going to go off by itself. That's a single replacement reaction. Next is double replacement reaction. This is where we have two compounds. This is very similar to a single replacement reaction, but this time we have two dance partnerships. Here we have partners AB and here we have partners CD. And what they're going to do is they're just going to change up friends. They're going to change up partners. And A is going to go dance with D and C is going to go dance with B, always sticking to opposite charge. So here, here's lead to nitrate and potassium iodine. Lead is going to go dance with the potassium and our lead is going to go dance with iodine, I'm sorry, and potassium is going to go dance with nitrate. Same thing, iron 2 sulfide and hydrochloric acid both do a double replacement reaction, each switching their elemental partners. All right, the last type of reaction is called a combustion reaction. 
Here it's pretty straightforward. We have a hydrocarbon fuel that combines with oxygen gas to create carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water are kind of key indicators that let us know that a combustion reaction is taking place. Now a hydrocarbon fuel is typically between hydrogen and carbon stuck together. This could be like methane in this first example here. It's reacting with oxygen to create carbon dioxide and water. The next one is, a, is isopropyl alcohol. You can light isopropyl alcohol on fire with the presence of oxygen in the air, and it will also create carbon dioxide and water. All right, let's just do a practice being able to classify these reactions. So let's say we wrote these reactions and we want to be able to classify them. The first one is a decomposition reaction. Notice we're starting with one reactant. That's all we have, and it creates two products. The second is a single replacement reaction. Notice we have our single element and then a compound, and that element replaces one of the elements in that compound. The third one is a composition, or also called a synthesis reaction, where we have two things combining together to make one. The fourth one is a double replacement reaction. We have two partnerships. Sodium goes with chlorine, hydrogen goes with hydroxide to create water, and that's a double replacement reaction. And then the last one, is a combustion reaction. We have some type of a hydrocarbon fuel and oxygen, and we create carbon dioxide and water. All right, that's the end of our notes. Take the time to review these notes and highlight key terms. You might want to ponder and ask some questions and summarize by answering the essential question in a deep way. Good luck.